Hello. How's this sounding back there? Thank you for the back row, folks. Uh, yes, hello, welcome. My name is Isaac Castellano. I am the Associate Director for the Institute uh, for Advancing American Values. Uh, welcome to Boise State Listens. Take a second and silence their phones, please. We got a few snacks and drinks in the back corner there, so please help yourself as we get underway here. Uh, tonight, once again, we get the opportunity to listen to students from across our campus on what they value and why, and how that value is expressed in their social, political, economic, or educational positions. In a few minutes, I'll ask Alan Dalton, Emeritus Faculty in the Department of Economics, to say a few words about the logistics of tonight's evening, of this, of this evening's event, excuse me. Uh, first, however, I'd like to make a few comments about the Institute and offer a little context for the event. The Institute was established three years ago to address the challenges of partisanship by Boise State President Marlene Trump and our inaugural director, Andrew Finstum. Uh, and current director, I should add. Uh, our core mission is to advance understanding and differing interpretations of the values that define and shape the United States of America, to further respectful engagement and critical thinking in public education and public life. As an institute, we understand that this country doesn't fit together in a neat and easy way. Our founding fathers understood this. James Madison in Federalist Paper Number 10 made this point very clearly. And normally, a historian would like quote here, but I'm a political scientist, so I'm going to breeze over the quote. The issue with partisanship with differing values is as old as our country. Uh, America has never had a unified vision or set of values that we all agree on. Yet, something is a little different these days. The political environment for many Americans has become a toxic space. Many have disengaged. Better to avoid the negative news, not turn on your TV, not read a newspaper. And I've heard a lot of folks talk about this upcoming presidential cycle like it's a storm they have to weather, or something to avoid, as opposed to an opportunity to have a conversation about what the most important issues, most important questions are of the day. Um, and the, the other side of the, pro of the other side of the divide is really the problem and if only they would get out of the way, could we really live a better life in harmony? Uh, and survey data really reflects this. The Pew Research Center has found that Democrats and Republicans are increasingly viewing each other as closed-minded, dishonest, immoral, and my favorite, unintelligent, like half the country was foolish or stupid or something. Between 2016 and 2022, the percentage of Republicans who thought that Democrats were dishonest went from 45%, so still pretty high number, to 72%. And for Democrats viewing Republicans as dishonest, the numbers went from 42 to 64 in just six years that that occurred. For the value of a moral, or the judgment of a moral, Republicans' views of Democrats went from 47 to 72 in that same 2016 to 22 period, and for Democrats, 35 to 63 percent. So really, moving towards supermajorities that view the other side as dishonest and immoral. And if the other side is dishonest and immoral, then why bother compromising? Why bother talking? Why bother to listen? And of course, we have things we can blame for this. It's hard not to mention the general atrophy we've developed living in our cultural bubbles. That's prevented us from hearing the other side. Uh, we've cut off communication with family members because of political disagreements. I'm sure everyone has heard or has had that experience. Uh, and really, the road we're on is not a healthy one. Uh, we're not on our way to a vibrant, functioning, and robust democracy. We need to do something different. So we here at the Institute for Advancing American Values, we are not about paving over these differences or ignoring them or thinking we're all going to come together in some utopian dimension. Um, and we don't aim to change people's positions or values. We're not here to change anyone's mind. But we do expect, and James Madison expected, that there'd be some kind of discussion, that there would be some interest in seeking out compromise, that we would do this to prevent tyranny, 
Because what happens if one side really is successful and gets their way? Would that be democratic? Would that be fair? And one can say that we, uh, that we did at various times, and in recent memory, have some sense of civility, of compromise, of listening, that we didn't question the intentions of those with whom we disagreed with. To what extent everyone would agree with that statement might be up for debate, but what is true is that we, don't have, that we didn't have supermajorities who view the other side as dishonest and immoral. We here at the Institute don't think we're going to completely solve partisanship, but we're also prepared not to, we're also uh, not prepared to sit back and do nothing about it. We have a slate of programs designed to create space on and off our campus for dialogue, the exchange of ideas, and of course listening. We want people to be able to express their views and for others to listen, if nothing else, to better understand those with whom they disagree with. Not understanding is ignorance, and as a university, we're in the business of enlightenment. We're also in the business of keeping space for a diverse set of views, values, and positions here on campus. And we have a series of programs and events designed to do just that. We organize the Distinguished Lecture Series, which is coming up next month on March 13th, where we'll have nationally known critic of higher education, Jonathan Haidt, here. And that's 7 p.m. in the Morrison Center. Last October, we had Robert George and Cornell West, two major public intellectuals from either side of the political divide who are friends and have been traveling the country speaking about how we can come together. Last spring, we had Arthur Brooks, who told our audience that you should confront and critique your side of the divide with more energy and focus than your own and to find ways to bridge to, bridge, uh, to build bridges to the other. We host the Campus co uh, Conversations in partnership with the Heterodox Academy Campus Community, where faculty and staff have space to discuss the challenges facing campus and higher education more broadly. Our next one is this coming Friday at 11.30 for those Boise State faculty and staff in the room here. And we're gonna discuss institutional neutrality. We have an undergraduate fellows program where we have a group of students who provide insight in how we go about engaging students in this project. They have organized a reoccurring student forum where students can come to discuss hot button topics of the day, such as gun control, political extremism, and their next event is March 5th. We have a research grant program where scholars from across campus are funded to explore American values and how they intersect with their respective research. And this spring, as part of a grant from the Idaho Humanities Council, we're organizing three civic and community engagement fairs in Nampa, Boise, and Twin Falls, where any organization can come and recruit volunteers in a job like job fair like format and we're asking citizens to come 10 to 15 minutes and see what's going on in their community and of course we have the listens project this is the sixth listens event we've had three Idaho listens in Boise Idaho Falls and Quarter Lane and in April will be in Caldwell Idaho Public Television has produced a documentary about this program and you can find a link to it on our website or theirs and this is the third time we've had Boise State listens and we'll do do it again in the fall at the core of our mission is the idea of value pluralism, the notion that our country and campus is better off with a mixture of views, ideas, policies, and of course values. We believe that any functioning democracy starts with sharing and listening. We need people to express themselves, share their thoughts, dreams, struggles, vision for the future in a civil way, and we need the rest of us to listen and engage. No one group is right about everything, certainly not when we're talking about what the whole country should do on any given question or issue. So, with that in mind, I want to invite, before I invite Alan Dalton to the stage, excuse me, to share the logistics piece, I want to uh, express a few uh, comments of gratitude. First, I want to thank our absolutely nine fantastic speakers who have come here tonight to uh, share their values with you, and I want to thank them for their courage. I'd like to thank Greg Carr for his generosity in making this event possible. And I want to extend an enormous thank you to Nancy Buffington, our speaker coach who has worked with each speaker in this process with all across all of the events. Uh, the content of their remarks, of the students' remarks, are their own, and Nancy's role has been to help flush out their thoughts and offer some help in how they present it. I also want to thank event services, the TV production crew you see behind us, Boise State Communications, um, and the other folks who've helped make this uh, night possible. And lastly, to all of you, thank you for being here. It's greatly appreciated that you've come to listen to our students share with you what they value and why. Thank you. Hello, I am Alan Dalton. I'm an emeritus uh, faculty in the economics department and an institute fellow. 
Welcome to Boise State Listens. This afternoon's program is meant to help us practice reverent listening. To practice listening, listening without thinking about or worrying about responding. If you have not done so, please silence your cell phone. There's going to be a lot of silence tonight. At the end of the speakers, a QR code will be available at the round tables in the back for those students who are here for extra credit. Also at those tables, there are paper surveys, just eight questions, associated with one of our students' senior thesis. He and we would appreciate if you would take time to fill those out. At the end of the first five speakers, we will take a 10-minute break to contemplate what we've heard, and then we will hear from the last four speakers. At the conclusion of all speakers, we will thank all of our speakers, and they sh then share some cookies and conversation with each other. Your job, my job also, students' jobs, is to refrain from clapping or overt displays of agreement or disagreement. This does not mean that a spontaneous chuckle, and there will be some tonight, or tear, there might be some tonight, or a smile is forbidden. Just nothing overt. Be silent and respectful as we listen. Be curious as we listen. Be gracious and charitable as we listen. That sounds easy, but as our students found out in the dress rehearsal, that's also sometimes difficult. So it might help to get us some energy out to give an even bigger round of applause for our nine students. I'll introduce our first speaker in each half of the program, and then each student afterwards will introduce themselves. Their names are in the um, handout that was given to you. With that, our first speaker is Katie Heddle. Okay, so you might think I sound crazy, maybe a little inconsiderate, but when I was younger, I never asked my grandma how her day was, and I don't regret it. Almost every night after dinner, I would grab the landline, click the redial button, and patiently circle around my bedroom waiting for the click of the receiver that told me I was about to hear her voice. My grandma would answer, and almost immediately, I would begin our conversation by asking her, hi grandma, what time did you wake up? Or hi grandma, what did you have for breakfast? I never asked my grandma how her day was because I didn't care. I didn't care to hear the word good or that her day was just all right because those simple words never told a story. The generic, the generic reply of I'm fine, how are you, leaves so much untold. It's going through the motions with no consideration of the emotions that constantly surround our every thought, decision, and action. I value the details in life because the details are what show purpose. The details are what make us real. It seems like everyone is always rushing to get to the point. It's easy to tune out a conversation until you hear something you know you can reply to, and it's easy to fake interest. But what's left when all you do is passively wait for the next topic to be brought up? These surface level conversations are completely dismissing the fact that we are all human with millions of little details that make up our passions, our desires, and our character. An author named Annie Dillard said, how we spend our days is of course how we spend our lives. And as simple as this may seem, it truly feels forgotten. We can look back on the life of someone we loved and conclude that they lived happily, but it really doesn't mean anything if we don't understand the stories that contributed to the joy and satisfaction that they felt. I value the details because they act as a window into another person's story. When I was eight and making my nightly phone calls to my 68-year-old grandma, we didn't really have that much in common because sadly, my Barbie collection was not as impressive as I thought it was. <laughs> but even when I shared the details of how I dressed my dolls in the morning before school, 
I opened a window into my life that allowed her to almost feel the excitement I felt when I would find the outfit that matched perfectly with the Barbie doll shoe that I had just found under my bed earlier that morning. The details can help tie together these generational differences. I wanted to hear about my grandma's bowling league just as much as she wanted to hear about my first sleepover. And although we were in two different walks of life, we both felt so much joy in sharing our experiences, and I think that's what life is really about. What I really love about learning the details is that simply asking a person these deeper questions can completely change the trajectory of a relationship. I love getting to know my friends and family more. I love hearing their stories, but there's a whole world of people out there to meet and listen to, and that's something I truly cherish. Earlier this year, I was at the Trader Joe's just down the street, and I was buying a plant, and as I was going to check out, I saw this lady with a super bright smile and a little flower in her hair, and her name was Lisa. And as she was going through my cart and grabbing the things that she was gonna ring up, we began to talk. I remember the first thing that she asked me was if I was going to name the plant that I had just bought. And it kind of took me off guard because I was expecting the typical, oh, what are your plans for today? Or like, what are you up to? But then I realized that she was searching for the details of my life, a complete stranger's life. We ended up talking even after the, my card had been accepted and my receipt was in my hand. And I learned that she strongly believes in naming things, like her plants or her cars, because she thinks it helps her care for them better. This detail gave me perspective into Lisa's life. It made her a person. It showed me the values she upholds, and it gave our conversation meaning. It felt real. So maybe Lisa doesn't remember that day at all. Maybe she didn't even give it a second thought. But in that moment, she was opening up our interaction to a deeper connection. She created the space for both of us to push past the surface level questions and it was refreshing to know that people are still seeking out the stories that we all hold. Valuing the details isn't about memorizing all of your friend's favorite fruit or what they would do if they woke up on a deserted island. It's simply about showing people that you care and that you are ready to listen and ready to learn. Learning the details will open you up to new perspectives. It will provide you with the opportunity to grow. It will give you the space to be human and simply feel fulfilled through meaningful interaction. Asking someone about their day is easy. It will get you an answer, and it'll make you seem like you care at least a little bit. But getting those details, that's what will really transform your relationships. And it is what will bring you closer to the people who surround you, whether that be your grandma or a grocery store worker. I've learned to become more com comfortable and confident in asking for the details, and it has added so much meaning to my life. It can feel awkward at first, maybe even a little pushy, to push past these generic questions and instead ask for the details, but it really does change the way in which you value a person. Friday morning, I called my grandma, and she picked up the phone, all excited to hear from her granddaughter, and still the first thing that I asked was, hey grandma, what did you eat for breakfast? And if you were wondering, she had yogurt with blueberries and honey and one Brazil nut, because she said she didn't want too much selenium. So I say that everyone should take the time to find details, because they are who we are. Hello, my name is Isaac Stone. Our society is suffering through an unspoken yet deadly epidemic. 85% of youth in prison come from fatherless homes. 71% of high school dropouts come from fatherless homes. 60% of youth suicides come from fatherless homes. The lack of a strong masculine presence has had a profoundly negative impact on this generation. What's worse is that this cycle only repeats itself. Fatherless environments create a false sense of masculinity. Society has deemed this toxic masculinity. While the behaviors that gave real masculinity this mantra, rape, sexual assault, infidelity, violence, are heinous, it has led to the misconception that masculinity in and of itself is evil. This is not to misconstrue the idea that men ought to strive to abolish these unrighteous activities from their lives. Instead, it is about reclaiming the definition of ma mis masculinity and bringing it into new light. Poor masculinity hurts women. It is selfish. It forces them to abandon their femininity. Good masculinity, masculinity in its purest form, creates a safe space for women to be feminine. Men today need good masculine models. I've been blessed to have these models. These people have shown me different aspects of what it is to be a man. Being a man is about being able to work with your hands. When I was about eight years old, 
my father started bringing me out into the yard to help with the construction around the house. I remember learning how to use the table saw for the first time, terrified of cutting my fingers clean off. I remember spending hours over multiple days building an irrigation system or working on the treehouse. He didn't know it, but he was instilling within me a passion to build and create. Years later, I ended up taking a job in construction over the summers. The impact that a father has on his children is immeasurable. My father wasn't able to give me the full picture of what it means to be a man. But here are more examples of people who did. Being a man is about connecting with nature. We are created to be in tune with creation itself, and without adventure, life is boring. I remember spending most of my childhood outside with friends, which is a rare sight among kids these days. We would ride our bikes, jump, finding jumps and trails. We would explore the woods, chasing around each other around with airsoft guns. My best friend growing up, Aiden, and I, would spend from dawn till dusk building mountain bike trails in the canyon of his backyard. This yearning for adventure in the outdoors instilled within me a passion for activities like backpacking, camping, and hiking that will continue well into my adult life. While I may sound like an old grump, it's true that nowadays children spend their time on screens instead of playing in their backyard. Young men can safely express their masculinity through adventure and getting their hands dirty outside. Being a man is about being brave. There comes a time when a man is faced with two options, give in to fear or face it with courage. I remember days as a teenager on my grandfather's ranch when I was tasked with some dangerous missions. One day, much to my mother's dismay, I was to climb a tree with a chainsaw in one hand and the fear of God in the other. Another day, I was taught how to ride our most stubborn horse with no riding experience whatsoever. I quickly became a fast learner. In both of these scenarios, I was scared. Only a fool wouldn't be afraid of what could happen. But I quickly realized that it wasn't about if I was scared. It was a matter of if I was going to overcome it. These days, men are quickly discouraged. A challenge seems too insurmountable. A new opportunity strikes fear. A healthy, masculine man will be afraid, but he will be brave, too. Being a man is about being in touch with your emotions. After my parents' divorce, I was left without a strong father figure in my life. When my stepdad came into my life, it wasn't in the most fashionable way. The first time I ever met him, he put me in a figure four leg lock and made me cry. It wasn't the greatest first impression. Later that evening, I had a tough conversation with him, and he apologized, and we did make up. We've had our quarrels throughout the years, but every time, he's made sure we had the tough conversation afterwards. He's done a fantastic job making sure I know how to communicate my feelings as a man. Being a man is about having a belief, a foundation, a worldview. Some aren't lucky enough to have great masculine figures in their lives. Many of the men that struggle are in their situation because they haven't had a father figure. I have good news for those lost men. 2,000 years ago, there was a man from Nazareth. He was a carpenter, so he knew how to work with his hands. He was so connected with nature that he could calm the raging seas. He was brave in the face of death, yet he wept at the death of his friend. His name was Jesus Christ, and he is the epitome of what it means to be masculine. If you have nobody else to look to, look to him. If you have no foundation, let him be your cornerstone. So, what does it look like to be a good man? If you can't be a father, you can be a father figure. My sport was baseball. I was the only one in the family to play, taking after my mother. During my high school years, I grew a strong bond with my pitching coach. This guy was scary, jacked, but amazing at baseball. And he was also one of the most sincere people I've ever met. At the end of a frustrating senior season, my coach looked at me and told me to forget it. That it didn't matter how good I was at baseball, but about the kind of man that I was becoming. He looked me in the eyes and told me that if he could have a son, he'd want him to be just like me. That was two years ago, but every word means just as much today. Every person that I've mentioned has had a significant impact on my masculinity. They've made me want to be the man that they were for me. One way that I've done that is by working here at the Children's Center. I've been there for over a year now, and one of my favorite stories is from recently. One day, one of, my parents, one of the parents came up to me as they were picking their kid up and told me that I was one of the characters in their children's doll story. Now, I've built fences, dug holes, 
rode horses, and used a chainsaw 20 feet in the air. I've felt masculine before, but I have never felt like more of a man than when a three-year-old girl told me I was the main character in her imagination. Imagine you're in a new social setting, meeting new people, engaging in the typical small talk of introducing your name, and then your major, and then where you're from, and so on. A conversation I think all college kids know a little too well. Then my turn comes around, and I say, hi, my name's Ani Carnell, I'm a psychology major, and I'm from Boise, Idaho. And then usually go on to the next person, but every so often I'm hit with that follow-up question that's starting to get a little too familiar now. That, but where are you really from? as if the concept of a black girl growing up in Idaho is some puzzle that's too complex to solve. Now, to give credit when it's due, they aren't completely wrong, as I wasn't born here in Boise, but it is where I've spent pretty much my whole life, the past 19 out of 20 years to be exact. Not only is Boise where I've lived, but it's where I've learned, where I've loved, where I've met my best friends, where I've been able to go into the person that I've become today. Now, of course, I don't remember the first year of my life, but I know that I was born in Portland, Oregon, and spent that year in foster care with my twin brother, Andre. Then after, we were adopted by a white couple who were originally from Tennessee, but had been living in Boise for some time. My twin and I then became the last of seven children in the Carnell family. My mom had always wanted to have a big family, so my parents ended up having three kids, then adopted four, currently have 10 grandchildren, one great-grandchild, four dogs, and my brother's pet lizard, Davy. Most of my siblings were much older and were already on their own when we arrived, except Tony, who was five years older than us. So growing up, I spent most of my childhood with my two brothers, running away from Andre's Nerf guns or making silly videos with Tony. Tony has always been an important person to me in my life because as a black queer person, they're never afraid to be themselves and speak their mind. I never had a problem when it came to making friends in school. In fact, some of the people I value most, I've been best friends with since kindergarten. I played sports growing up, joined clubs, went to school dances, and just overall have always enjoyed getting involved into things outside of my academics. Although I had friends that loved and cared for me just as much as I did for them, there were still times where I felt out of place in my adolescence. I recall my freshman year in high school. As the academic year was getting closer to an end and the sunshine seemed to radiate our friend group's excitement for the approaching summer break, I remember us girls all discussing what we wanted to do after school that day since it was so nice out. One of them suggesting, Let's go tanning at my house. Now, I don't remember exactly what I said in that exact moment, but I would hope it would be along the lines of, sure, but I'll bring the shade. There have been plenty of times and moments now and then where I felt like I couldn't relate to my white peers, whether it was finding myself at the tail end of a braid chain during team gatherings, or that one time during a basketball team bonding hangout, we decided to play around a truth or dare. And the girl next to me was dared to imitate the person to their left, that being me. I don't remember word for word what the girl said, but I remember it being along the lines of, oh hey, I'm Ani, I'm so cool, and I act white. I do remember in that moment just kind of laughing it off and going along with it, but honestly down the line it was something that made me question my identity. Who was I supposed to be? What was I supposed to act like? What did that girl expect when I've only lived with and around white people my whole entire life? Even when I tried to talk and hang out with the other black kids at my school, I still felt out of place with them too as they would talk about the authentic African dinners they would eat and how their sister taught them to braid their hair, just more experiences I never had. Throughout my life, I have been fortunate to be surrounded by family and friends who have always made a conscious effort to acknowledge and celebrate my racial heritage. I loved my family and my friends just the way they were, but during this time of feeling out of place, I didn't have that same love for myself. This experience made me realize the importance of being true to myself, regardless of others' expectations. This realization became even more crucial when the year 2020 arrived. As the COVID-19 pandemic spread throughout the world, we found ourselves seeking re refuge within the confines of our own homes. This period was hard for me because I was missing my friends, yearning for social interaction, learning more about politics during a heated election season, and then a surge in focus on the Black Lives Matter movement following the murder of George Floyd. Not only did I become more aware of what was happening in the world, but I also became more aware of my own intersecting identities as a black woman. As my mental health started to decline during this time, I started to realize that being true to myself was not just about defying others' expectations, but also about acknowledging my own feelings and seeking help when needed. 
I'd never gone to a counselor before, but I remember one day just sitting on my bed and just straight up Googling black women counselors in Boise. I knew that not only was I limited in my choices for a counselor in this predominantly white community, but that I wanted to talk to someone who would understand my experiences, not only as a woman, but as a black woman. This whole experience led me to discovering what I knew I wanted to major in in college, psychology. The first time I took a psychology class was in high school, and I immediately fell in love with the subject. I also thought that if I'm going through these feelings, there are probably other black girls out there who need someone to talk to, who will understand their experiences and can provide them the support that they need. So I thought to myself, why not become that person? After the year 2020, not only did I become more confident in my identity, but I also became even more involved in the communities that I cared about. One of my first experiences with getting involved was actually with my family. During 2021, about every weekend, we'd go down to the state building, meet up with others, and try to influence people to go out and get registered to vote. As we'd stand on the side of the road with signs and wave to cars, people would drive by and honk in support, and sometimes we'd even get fingers thrown at us as well. But there's just something that felt so fulfilling about being involved and just even educating myself about things I wasn't aware of before. I started to follow local social media activist pages, read articles, and started attending events that advocated for women's rights, climate education, gun control, a ceasefire for the ongoing genocide in Palestine. I, recognized, I realized that if I wanted to see change in my community or even the world, that I could and should be a part of it. Before coming to my freshman orientation at Boise State, I pictured college as this big melting pot with different colors and people, as I would see on my social medias and shows that I watched. And although there are definitely people here with different experiences and ethnic backgrounds, the reality didn't align with my initial expectations after experiencing my first walk through campus. So what did I do? I got involved. I joined the campus's Black Student Association, and I also helped with the process of creating a new club, Student Liberation Collective, a club designed to help protect, create, and celebrate spaces for students, especially those a part of underrepresented and marginalized groups. This past year, I also took on the role of being an orientation leader. I recognized it as not just an opportunity to become more involved on campus, but also a platform to represent and affirm the, black pres uh, the presence of black students like myself. I wanted to de demonstrate that yes, there are indeed black individuals from Idaho who are deserving of the same respect and Boise kindness that's extended to everyone else. As we celebrate Black History Month, it's a reminder of our shared responsibility to honor this truth and continue fostering an inclusive community. Through my journey of self-discovery and authenticity, I've come to realize the important value of representation. Just as I saw a counselor who could understand my experiences as a black woman, I believe it's crucial for all underrepresented groups to see themselves reflected in all aspects of life. Not only is this just about feeling welcomed and, and accepted, but it's also about having the opportunity to thrive in our own communities, especially the places we call home. Thank you. Hello, my name is Ethan LaHaug, and I'm blessed to live in this country and to have been given a loving family. But much of my life has felt like a series of rugs were being pulled out from under me. I was born in Boise in 2003, and I lived the first few years of my life here. It was a very happy beginning. I remember rolling down grassy hills and a particularly happy birthday celebration. But not long after I was born, we would move to Virginia. This was the first of many moves as my dad worked for Micron and he chased opportunity wherever it led him. So I settled in, I found a passion for running and for exploring the outdoors, but as the Great Recession arrived and our family felt the pain, my dad chose to become an expat for better pay. Of course, this would mean leaving behind our home, my friends, and the country I was growing up in. So we did, and that was the first of many rugs being pulled. I don't know exactly when we left, but the last thing I remembered of America was uh, the election of President Obama, and it was not long after that that we were on a flight across the Pacific Ocean. Micron had sent us to Taiwan. We'd live in downtown Taipei in a high rise, and then on Yamingshan Mountain in a house with giant metal gates and glass shards embedded in the walls to keep out intruders. 
I started at an American school, made friends, and began learning to speak Mandarin. But again, after less than three years, we left our new home, my new friends, my new language. It felt, again, like the rug had been pulled out. Returning to Boise, we'd live in four houses in only five years. We would leave neighborhoods and friends behind with each move. And as for school, I moved from elementary school to homeschool to skipping a grade to junior high to finally entering high school. A few more rugs were pulled out in those years. It became exhausting, and I began to feel as if I would never find steady ground. All this moving and, and losing of friends I'd worked so hard to make left me hesitant to reach out, to try to make friends, or to allow myself to get comfortable, because I was almost certain that there'd be another disruption and it would all go away. Everyone around me had known each other since kindergarten, but I hadn't known anyone since kindergarten. And it felt impossible and pointless to, to try and break into their social circles. So around the time of my sophomore year in high school, I just stopped engaging with everything. I stopped talking to people. I stopped doing the things I loved. I stopped living. I was alive, but I didn't want to be. Even though my parents cared about me very much, they didn't know what to do. So I shut the blinds, pulled the blackout curtains, and laid in my room alone for months, um, wishing for death to visit me. I wouldn't shower. I ate a lot and gained a lot of weight. And to be honest, I don't remember much of that period because a symptom of clinical depression is memory loss. So how did I get out of this? I still consider it somewhat of a miracle, actually. It was a message I found in this depressive stupor while I was aimlessly watching YouTube. A video came up from uh, Dr. Jordan B. Peterson, who's a Canadian clinical psychologist and former Harvard professor. Peterson had an unusual message for people like me who were struggling. He said, you better hope that you're the problem. Because if you are, then you can fix it. But if you blame circumstance, if you blame society, if you blame the world, then the world is the problem. And good luck trying to change the world when you can't even get yourself out of bed. So imagine what this said to a kid who was decaying in the belief that life was a dead end for him, that he'd never have a friend, never accomplish anything, never love. I could see that the solution to my depression rested with me. And Peterson's recommendation for people like me was to clean your room. So that's what I did. Literally, I drew back the curtains and cleaned my room until it was spotless. I started with what I could immediately control, my room. And I worked outward to things like my physical fitness, my diet, my attitude. You might notice that uh, joining my outfit today is a pair of worn down sneakers. These are actually the fourth generation in a long line of walking shoes that I've worn literally until the soles came apart. Once I'd cleaned my room, my next move was to literally walk myself out of the hell surrounding me. So I put on my shoes, leashed up my dog, an Australian Shepherd named Ayla, and walked. Not long at first, not far at first, but soon I was doing four miles a day trekking about the Boise foothills with Ayla. And I did this for three years, hardly missing a day, 2,000 miles. I found that after I took responsibility for the things I could control, the challenges of life weren't so hopelessly terrifying anymore. So when the rug was pulled out from under all of us, when the COVID pandemic hit, for the first time in my life, I found that I was ready to meet the challenge Instead of abandoning my friendships, they deepened through the struggle. Instead of withdrawing from the world, I ventured into it and thrived. But there would be one final sequence of rugs. The moment it happened is seared into my memory. I was standing in front of my reflection in the bathroom mirror for some reason when I got a phone call from my dad to tell me that his marriage was ending and that he wasn't really the person I thought he was. Through it all, all the moves, the different schools, the challenges, at least I'd had a stable home life. At least my parents were a constant. Now, as I prepared to go off to college, their relationship and their presence would be gone as the divorce forced them to sell the house and move across the country. All I could do was focus on what I could control. And for me, that became my daily hikes with Ayla. 
So I hope you can see how, amidst a life of instability, I'm left trying to cling to what I know, to what's the same. Rather than radical change, I want what's familiar. That's why I am a conservative. It's why, for example, I am firmly against the idea that a person can change their sex or their gender. For me, it's a complete reversal of the comfortable categories of male and female with which I grew up. This relatively recent paradigm shift in how we view biology and human relations, to me, feels like not a rug, but a slat being pulled out from under the foundation of our society. Now, the desire to preserve what I know has also manifested itself in how I act as a student leader. Last year, our student government fought extensively over the role of diversity, equity, and inclusion, or DEI, and what role it should take in our system. I opposed DEI because I wanted to return to the America that I knew when I left America as a child. That America had just elected its first black president, and kids like me grew up assuming that a person's race shouldn't matter to the pursuit of their dreams. But then along came the academics behind DEI to tell us that wasn't true and that we actually must discriminate now in order to make amends for discrimination in the past. Such a proposition is very jarring to me. It feels like a rug being pulled out from under the goal our country has shared for the, pa for the past 60 years to eliminate discrimination once and for all. Those of you in this room who were part of those debates last year, I hope even if you think my solution is and was misguided and wrong, you can see I'm at least motivated not by prejudice or ignorance, but by the desire to conserve the equal and multiracial ideal of America that I grew up with. And lastly, I want people to know that I'm not just a social conservative. I also want to conserve the environment that we all share. I recognize that being outdoors and active in Boise's foothills played a huge part in my recovery from depression. When COVID hit and choked off all the pollution in our state, from the route I'd walk every day with Ayla, I could see clear across the valley to the Owyhee Mountains, to the majesty of that range. There's something therapeutic about that, something that we're tied to as humans, which I want to preserve and share with others. I believe that economic benefits come second to protecting the natural beauty of the planet that God gave us. Now, if there's one thing I can leave you with today, it's this. There's so much more to people than meets the eye. That shy kid who keeps to himself might be doing that because he's terrified of another rejection or loss. And that conservative who stands opposite you on a given issue may share many of your core motivations. He may share your desire for an America where race isn't an obstacle to anyone, but he simply sees a different solution. Challenge yourself to see the human whose surface is barely scratched by your first impression. Hello, my name is Nicholas Gibbons, and through a long period of self-reflection and studying, I've come to value liberty above all else. I've come to this conclusion mainly through reading authors such as Murray Rothbard and Carl Menger, who extol the beauties of liberty. However, when I reflect back on the reason why I chose to read these authors, it seems like a bit of blind luck. I grew up in a Christian conservative household in Southern California until my family moved to Idaho in 2014, seeking better business conditions for my father's small engineering business. As I watched my father build this business, I grew up with somewhat of a spirit that if you want something, then you, you ought to take steps to accomplish it. This spirit burned within me, and to this day, I have a strongly held belief that we as humans ought to be striving to become the best that we can be. To paraphrase Viktor Frankl, life forces challenges upon us, and we find meaning in meeting those challenges. Fast forward to 2020, when I found myself stagnating, both mentally and physically, for, well, reasons I hardly need to explain. I felt a deep inner uneasiness, and in order to quell this uneasy feeling, I set towards bettering myself. This took the form of going for runs to keep active and listening to podcasts to mute the cries of my legs. At first, the shows I would listen to were mainly comedy shows. However, the guests that the comedians had, had on had such interesting and deep thoughts on topics 
and I was drawn into history and political podcasts which hooked me. I found myself caring more and more about the esoteric and philosophical concepts which undergird politics and economics. It was fascinating to me, and this kindled anew the fire of curiosity. Eventually, through listening to the historian and economist Tom Woods' show, I was introduced to Karl Menger and his magnum opus, Principles of Economics. This felt like opening my eyes for the first time, and I was able to see the rhyme and the reason to people's decisions. From this point, I began delving further into related literature, discovering philosophers such as Murray Rothbard, who argues for the primacy of liberty and how it is a precondition for any human flourishing. To the extent which any of us have goodness in our lives, it is because we have a modicum of liberty which permits us to seek and attain our chosen ends. Thus, I had found an intellectual home after only a year or so of searching and rapidly set myself towards deepening my understanding of both the methodology and the concepts therein. Whilst I was thinking through these thoughts and expanding my horizons, I was simultaneously undergoing a period of the most and the least freedom I had ever experienced. I had moved out of my parents' house, and thus I was at the liberty to go for a 3 a.m. jog, if I so pleased. But simultaneously, I was being forced into some pretty crummy situations. At the time, I was working at a, at a breakfast restaurant where I had to prep bacon with a mask over my face. The mask would fall down, and my manager would bark at me, and I'd have to pull it up and pull it up and pull it up. As you can expect, with, with bacon fat all over the gloves, gets bacon fat all over my face. It was fairly miserable. Rothbard's argument was ringing in my ears. I was happy when acting under my liberties, but I felt cowed and lesser when acting without my liberties. Despite the feeling of being forced into doing things which I dislike, I was able to reflect. My life is good. Sure, there's things which I'm prohibited from doing, but overall, my life is great, and it's getting better. I've only lost some liberties, but how many more do I retain? Sure, I had fat all over my face, but I did get to choose what music I was listening to. This is just a small case with a relatively minor inconvenience, all things considered, but one can even take a much more extreme case of prison, where one has very little liberty. However, the prisoner can still find joy and meaning in his everyday life. He still has the liberty to choose to work out, to read, and to use his time in beneficent ways. He does not have most of his liberty, but he does have some of his liberty, and through this he can find meaning and happiness. We are all constrained in some ways, but we are all liberated in many ways. Even under the most repressive circumstances, man must have some liberty. He can hold his head high and seek goodness and find enjoyment in life. You can still have a smile on your face when it's covered in bacon fat. Thank you. First speaker of the second half is Cheon Sheen. I grew up in a Christian family. We walked to church every Sunday, studied the Bible, and prayed every night. I sang in the church choir, all my friends were from my church. I volunteered on the weekends with them. And of course, my favorite part, summer camp. Church was my entire life. Sunday, Wednesday, Friday, sometimes Saturday, Sunday again, and everything in between. But despite going to church faithfully and reading scripture, and participating in all these activities, I really struggled to feel a sense of belonging. Everyone around me said that they had this great relationship with God, and my best friend would talk about how she had prayed the other night, and she just really felt his love and his truth. And I wondered if I was missing something. Maybe my efforts were falling short. Maybe my prayers weren't sincere enough or loud enough. And this is something that I thought about for a long time. And in one summer camp, after several days of scriptures and nature and lesson and nature and friendship bracelets and nature and all the things, 
I just wanted to find some time to reflect. And so I took my five gallon bucket at the summer camp, we decided, like, let's not bring chairs, let's bring five gallon buckets where we made, like, cushions on top of the lid. And I had, like, all my essentials, and I was like, okay, I have my sunscreen, and my hat, and my socks, and journal, and the things. And I carried this five gallon bucket, and I just wandered off. And I found some of this tall grass that I was like, this is a great place I can just sit and journal. So I grab my, my bucket that has my journal in it, and I'm like, my bucket won't open. And I'm like, I just opened this like 10 minutes ago. And I'm trying, I'm trying, and I just can't open it. So I'm like, okay, kick drop the bucket. And uh, I'm like, fine, I'll just pray. So I get on my knees. And I start praying. And I start my prayer with thanks and gratitude. And then I really just start opening up my heart. And I ask God, God, have you forgotten about me? Do you see me? And I was like kind of waiting for an answer, you know? And then I opened my eyes, and right in front of me, there's these beautiful wild forget-me-not flowers. And I start crying. How, I, how had I not seen these before? They had always been my favorite flowers. All of God's children deserve to be seen. And if not by God, then by other people like you and me. It's about creating spaces for people to connect in. Spaces where they genuinely feel like they're embraced by our arms and that they belong. Sometimes we're a little hesitant to be inclusive. Does space for you mean less for me? I like how things are. If I include you, it might feel different for me. And that's not comfortable. Well, God didn't send us to be comfortable. God sent us to learn and grow and be like him and love like him. I don't know about y'all, but I plan to spend my entire life helping people feel seen, especially our most forgotten children of God. Forgive and forget. This is a phrase that everyone has heard. But I think this phrase does a disservice to the true meaning of forgiveness. As a little girl, I understood that giving and accepting apologies were important in resolving wrongdoings. I'm sure we've all had to say the words, I'm sorry, and I forgive you. And I would bet we've all been on the receiving end of those words as well. This universally shared experience just scratches the surface on why forgiveness is incredibly powerful. In the last few years, I've spent a lot of time reflecting and beginning to understand that in life, I can only control so much. So how I choose to harness that little bit of control says a lot about my character and perspective. Tonight, I'm gonna share with you my story and why I have chosen to lead with forgiveness. Many of us here in this room know that a mother's love is truly one of the most beautiful and holy feelings. I was a mama's girl through and through because for a long time it was just her and I. 
She had me very young, so it almost felt like I was her mini-me. We would match outfits and just be super girly together. I mean, we would have so much fun, whether we were dancing or shopping or watching early 2000s music videos before going to school and work. I totally idolized her. The problem here was that my mom also suffered from a severe opioid addiction. It didn't take me long as a child to come to terms with that because after all, she was still my mom. We all know that addiction plagues families and communities all over. It is a disease that rips our loved ones from our hearts. One of the worst parts of addiction is that those who suffer from it tend to lose touch with reality and also not see what happens around them. Unfortunately, in my case, this meant that for years as a young girl, I was abused in many ways by another member of my household, and my mom never noticed. Spending some of my most formative years abused, betrayed, and confused led to a lot of problems in my life. Even after I made the tough decision to leave that environment at the age of 15, I still struggled. My later teen years were filled with hatred, skepticism, distrust of others, and a lot of self-sabotage. I was hanging out with the wrong crowd and purposely doing bad in school. I was going down a path that was really scary, and there were times where I didn't see a way out. I really felt like it was impossible to let go of the pain and move on to a better life. It wasn't until I went off to college when I began to see a light ahead of me that promised a chance for happiness. But there was a point when I realized that reaching for this happiness was going to mean a lot of work on my end, a lot of work to reflect and confront the trauma that I had faced. When I visited home for the first time from college my freshman year was when I understood what I had to do. During this break from school, I found my mom, who was experiencing a nearly fatal overdose from fentanyl. In these moments, all I could think when I looked at her body was how much I loved her and how horrible I felt for not forgiving her for the past. But myself, my grandma, and my younger brother, we took the necessary action and we got the right people there and we saved her life. After then, I was again filled with more confusion and hurt. But then I thought back to the moments where I felt the opportunity to forgive her had passed, and I finally recognized that I needed to practice forgiveness going forward. I sat my mom down, and I poured my heart out to her, and I said, I forgive you, and I love you, and even if you never recover from this, those words will always stand true. You see, forgiveness is one of the hardest routes to take because when you are wronged by someone, especially someone who is there to protect you, the last thing you think to do is give them grace and forgive. But we are mistaken when we feel this because forgiveness isn't just about letting that person feel relief. It's about giving yourself the power to heal. When I chose forgiveness, I felt a weight lifted off my shoulders and I knew I had done the right thing. I promise you that holding on to grudges and pain from those who've wronged you is not the path forward. Choosing forgiveness is never going to be easy, but it is always necessary. As humans, we are simply imperfect beings, constantly faltering. In recent years, I have found a relationship with God, and the Bible has only confirmed that which I'm explaining to you today. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 31 through 32 reads, Get rid of all bitterness, rage and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. Regardless of your religious or spiritual outlook, I ask that you please consider this verse wholeheartedly, because learning to forgive is learning to love. There will never be a time where we go about life perfectly and without hurting others, but being a more forgiving person works to mend that. Next year, I'm going to be attending law school, and working in that field can sometimes feel cold and like it lacks the human element. But what I plan to bring with me is forgiveness and all that comes with that value, compassion, love, empathy, because we need to acknowledge each other as the complex beings that we are and that we make mistakes and we mess up, but we also love, we laugh, we create, we dream, and most importantly, we forgive. Forgiveness gives you the ability to recover from trauma as I have demonstrated for you today. 
To forgive is to be strong and see another for all of their worth. As I wrap this up, think of those who have wronged you and look to forgive, no matter how long it may take. I told you all earlier how we are only granted so little control in life. I cannot control the abuse I faced, the environment I grew up in, or my mom's addiction, but I can control finding a path to happiness through forgiveness. Life is so fleeting, and we never know what will come next. So my challenge to you is to forgive. Forgive others for their wrongdoings, and forgive yourself for your own faults. Because as I've said, you never know when that opportunity will be taken from you. Whether it be a daughter who forgave her mother, a friend forgiving friend, a brother forgiving sister, wife forgiving husband, let's all make the choice to forgive. Referring back to the phrase, forgive and forget, always remember to forgive, but never forget what you've been through and all that has made you the person that you are today. When growing up, I grew up in the church, and the one thing that I remember my mother always saying was to love thy neighbor as you would love yourself, followed by the question, who is my neighbor? Your neighbor is someone who doesn't just look like you, but is someone who doesn't look like you, who sits maybe right across from you, someone who you see passing by. This is something that has been the cornerstone of my being. Growing up in the church, my mother was a minister and my father was a deacon and they always instilled that the need to help your community must be greater than the want of the individual self. I always took this with me growing up. I always saw them helping out people of the church or people they didn't know. It's something that I wanted to strive for growing up and how it always came back to us in turn through hardships and trials and we faced our, what I thought would be my only time facing. It was my greatest trial. In 2007, my mother was diagnosed with cancer. And at those times, it was rare for anyone to know what to do with it. And people of the church always came over and helped us, helped us in our time of need, especially on July 12th of 2009, when I went into the hospital to see her and dad said mommy was gone. That instillness that she instilled in me was always there, and I always did it no matter what I did in high school, even in middle school, and even in my church. When I came here my freshman year, I didn't know what I was gonna do or how I would help. I just knew that I wanted to help someone in my time of need. And during the spring, when COVID happened, that is when the chance showed. The chance showed not only through a pandemic, but through racial inequality and in, in social injustice. The time where no one could stay on the sidelines anymore, and I knew I had to speak, and this is what God had showed me is what I needed to do. I joined the MLK Living Legacy the way to we could help our neighbors and the community. Show Boise State how the greatness that it has, but how it can be greater. Helping our community and those who don't even look like us. I joined this and through another challenge of us, having most of them being resigned, I was left alone. But the resolve stayed in where I needed to help someone. And I stayed helping trying to grow this organization, trying to help the community through these hard times, to show light in darkness. It was hard to show that light, especially within my own darkness. One day I get a call from my aunt, and she asks me, have you heard from your dad? And I'm like, no, I haven't. She's like, we haven't heard from him in three days. And I'm like, oh, he just turns his phone off. He does that sometimes. I call this phone, no big deal. I call the house phone and no one answers and I get worried. I have all my family, my brother, my sisters calling me and I'm like, okay, this is getting a little serious. I have my boss 
drive me to my house. And that's when I found him. He was gone. And once again, I was truly alone. I was broken. I didn't know what I wanted to do. But yet in that darkness showed the light of my community. The community came to me and I knew that this was the chance that I had to show that light again. It is by helping your neighbor that you are willing to show vulnerability no matter your circumstance and to build on that to helping your community in the greatest of times and the worst of times. The love has no limit and it is through all of us to show as I leave you with this, the one thing I want you to take with you when you go home, do your jobs, do your schools and classes, I want you to look into yourself and ask who are you and how can you help your neighbor? Yeah, I can't believe they asked me to go after that either. Um, thank you, Charles. What a beautiful speech that was. It is an honor and a privilege to speak to you all tonight. I am Crew Palmer, and there are three essential things you need to know about me before I start speaking tonight. One, I'm a sophomore here at Boise State. Two, I'm a pre-nursing student. And three, I believe in the beautiful weight of it all. Now, saying I believe in the beautiful weight of it all is an insane thing to say when nobody has a clue what that means. But to fully understand what I'm getting at tonight, there's some more essential information that you guys need to learn. This last semester sucked. Fall semester 2023 here at Boise State University hit me with a semi-truck, put in reverse, and then hit me again. You see, it all be began when I was rejected from the nursing program. I am blessed and honored to be part of a very competitive program here, and regarding my future as a nurse, my mom had promised me two things. One, I was cute as a button. But then also two, I was guaranteed to get in. I was smart, I was well-spoken, and I was her son. How the, would I not get in? She lied. You see, after the disappointment of not getting in, I would suffer from a serious case of head to toe stress hives, but after a few days, I would end up recovering. It was also after a few days, though, that I would get dumped by my then boyfriend as he moved across the country to fulfill his childhood dreams, or something equally stupid as that. But to keep it in context sake, you have to remember this was all happening a mere three days before I was meant to go home to the Thanksgiving break. And I felt that I was the definition of stumbling at the finish line. 10 seconds later, I would face plant in front of the proverbial finish line when my friend group, the people that I loved and trusted the most in college, would get into a huge altercation that leads to my main support system, the people that I love and trust the most, to no longer be on speaking terms to this day. I didn't just feel like a failure, I was a failure. I was an amalgamation of wasted potential, dreams, and parental disappointments. And now it was time to go home and tell my family exactly how much of a loser their son was. I felt that I was socially, romantically, and academically invalidated and had no real fault of my own. I would be lying if I didn't want, begin to wonder questions like, why me? What, what did I do? Is my life all that worth living? Is everything I've worked so hard for, 20 years of hard work, can be taken from me in less than two weeks. I began to struggle and I fell into a deep, dark depression where thoughts of suicide were scary, but also comforting in my darkest moments. Sorry, I'm so inspirational, I moved myself to tears. Um, <laughs> as you could all see though, I am blessed to be here today speaking to all of you. What helped me the most over the past couple months is finding the beautiful things in my life. The clouds were strangely beautiful as I was walking my dog around the block. My mom has a laugh so full of joy that I pity those who haven't heard it. 
And my nephew Cole, sweet four-year-old Cole, has a light, has a smile so bright that it lights up even the darkest room. Life is heavy and life is extremely hard, yet I still found a strange beauty in it. And I think that there's a place for both of these things to be true. The beautiful weight of it all. Now, as I wrap up my speech with you here today, I'm gonna leave you with a series of admittedly corny questions, but I hope they'll make you think. How lucky are you? You are alive right here and right now. And isn't that pretty cool? You're alive at the same time as me. You're alive at the same time as your dog. You're alive to see your favorite band perform. And you're alive to see your kids unwrap presents underneath the Christmas tree. You are lucky to be alive. You are luckier to be alive at the same time as somebody you love, but the luckiest to be alive at the same time as somebody who loves you. The human experience is a bizarre one. It's one that we all share, yet are born simultaneously knowing equally nothing about. And I think that's really cool and something that a lot of people seem to take for granted. What an amazing blessing that is. And regardless of your religious or spiritual beliefs, I think it would be a disservice to God, the universe, to whatever, who, to whatever or who or who not you believe in, to not look around and take that all in, to take the blessing of it seriously, to not look around and see the beautiful weight of it all. Be kind to one another. Thank you. Thank you all for t attending. There's still some cookies back there. Enjoy conversation with each other. Please fill out the forms in the back for our student senior thesis, if you would, and there are QR codes back there for the students who can take a picture of it and uh, get extra credit for your attendance. Thank you all for attending.